So thank you very much. So my name is Mike Farker. I'm a consultant in sleep medicine at the Evelina London Children's Hospital. Um, my day job is very much focused around about trying to help children and families deal with the four o'clock in the morning wakings and uh, the disruption that those kind of things cause. Um, I became a consultant about five years ago though and one of the things I really wanted to do when I became a consultant is to talk about exactly that. I think we don't talk enough about night shifts enough uh, in medicine. We don't talk enough about the fact that when we ask somebody to function at three o'clock in the morning, that is completely different to asking them to function at three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, the night when we are meant to be asleep, your brain is not expecting you to be functioning and doing anything at all other than sleep. Um, and to provide a 24 hour a day service, seven days a week, 365 days a year, we have to go against that. So I think we should talk an awful lot more about that. There are lots and lots of reasons why I think it's important. But the reason I wanted to start talking about this teaching when I became a consultant is because of stories like these. Um, these are junior doctors who have died. These are not old stories. Um, these are doctors who have died driving home, having finished night shifts, um, who have fallen asleep at the wheel of the car, driving home, crashed and died. Um, these were doctors who were working European Working Time Directive compliant rotors. They were working New Deal compliant rotors. They hadn't worked particularly unusual um, sets of nights or experiences compared to what um, everybody is doing uh, day in, day out in the NHS. Um, but they were all vulnerable as a, fact, uh, a consequence of the fact that they've been working at night. Um, when we look at that in different ways, the, the GMC survey uh, last year and this year has uh, specifically asked about sleep deprivation and fatigue. Um, last year, uh, the doctors completing the GMC trainee survey told us that they felt that sleep deprivation fatigue was impacting their ability to deliver care. This year, uh, the survey is just out this week. Um, about a fifth of uh, junior doctors who completed the survey said that they regularly feel sleep deprived and fatigued during their normal daytime functioning, let alone when we think about nighttime. Interestingly, if you ask the trainers who completed that survey as well, the more senior doctors uh, completing it, um, they also report that about a fifth of them feel exactly the same. Sleep deprivation, fatigue, how much that impacts on us is a hidden factor within the NHS and the care that we deliver. Um, the AAGBI um, uh, published uh, this week a survey looking in particular at the experience of anaesthetic trainees uh, with regards to fatigue. And this is a big survey looking at uh, anaesthetic trainees across the UK and um, specifically honing in on that idea of how much fatigue impacts them. One of the ways that we can do that is to look at how often that experience of dangerous driving uh, going home is, how common that feeling is. And they told us that about half of them felt that they were unsafe driving home after a night shift. That is, depending on how you ask that question, it comes out in different ways. Um, if you ask people if they've fallen asleep behind the wheel of a car, about four or five out of 10 will tell you that. If you ask them if they felt unsafe driving home, that number rapidly goes up to about 80, 90% um, fairly quickly. Um, that survey, as you probably will have saw, got a fair bit of media attention towards the end of last week. And we hope that that will then catapult um, further work to be done to, to try and improve this um, further. The challenge with that though, is that um, this is, uh, not particularly new science, this is not particularly new information. Um, as anaesthetists, you are all actually pretty good about this. In terms of medical specialties, uh, nobody actually probably thinks about fatigue more than you guys do. Um, the AGBI have on a couple of occasions now produced specific uh, documentation around about uh, fatigue and recommendations for that. So the second edition uh, came out uh, three years or so ago. Um, other organisations have also done that. Uh, so the Royal College of Physicians about 10 years ago produced a really excellent document that summarises the whole uh, science behind working at night, um, things that you can do to try and make that better, things that we should be doing as employers to adapt to that. Uh, the Nursing uh, College also produced documentation a few years later that said exactly the same thing. But these documents tend to come out, they tend to get a lot of people nodding heads and saying yes we should do something about it. But unfortunately, they don't often click and translate into practical changes. So despite the fact that all of these documentation, uh, the, these efforts to try and make this go back 10, 15 years, um, stories like this are not new. So the doctors falling asleep behind the wheel of a car is not the first time that we've got this into the national press. Uh, we've put it through the, our own press and said this is something we need to think about, that we should be challenging cultures around about this. Uh, we get into the papers saying that this is something that is not just about the safety of the staff, this also impacts on patient safety. If we are tired and fatigued when we're trying to deliver care, that impacts on our ability to safely do that. Um, and we keep trying to make this point in as many ways as we can, that fatigue is a hidden factor that we do not talk about enough in terms of the health care that we deliver. So I think there is a time where we have to try and stop and think about this properly and try and think about how we translate the 
the evidence, the knowledge that's been there for a very long time, I said none of this is new science, into things that can try and make this better. There are two key facts um, that I think are really important to think about in terms of uh, how we approach this. The first of those is um, trying to make people understand just how affected we are by fatigue. Um, over the course of my lifetime, there has been a very big public health campaign uh, around about changing our perception to drink driving. Um, so when I was a child, it was not unusual for the adults in my life to think it was okay to drink three, four or five pints of beer, get behind the wheel of a car. That was just what everybody did. It was normal. We have invested an awful lot in the public health message that says this that basically that if you have any alcohol on board, you should really think very seriously about getting behind the wheel of a car because we know that even a small amount of alcohol will significantly increase your risk of having a serious and if not fatal road traffic accident. Um, the question that I usually ask at this point um, is how long you need to be awake for before your reaction time is the same as if you're at the legal drink drive limit. And the answer to that is a lot less than I think most people realise. Um, what we are trying to avoid is people driving where the perception of driving looks a bit like this. What we know, and there is lots of evidence to back that up over the last few years, is that even relatively mild, moderate sleep deprivation puts you at the same point as if you're at the legal drink drive limit. If you have been awake for about 16 to 18 hours, then your reaction times will be the same as if you were at the drink drive limit. And that assumes that you have had the right amount of good quality sleep for you in the preceding days. If you were on night three of a three night run of night shift, you will not have slept normally in the few days prior to that. You will get to this point much quicker. You'll become much more vulnerable um, quicker than that. We would not usually um, expect people to get behind the wheel of a car if they had any alcohol on board, but we don't stop and think about getting behind the wheel of a car when we are tired and fatigued to this degree. But the science, the physiology is exactly the same. You are just as vulnerable driving while tired as you are if you're at the legal drink, dr pardon me, drink drive limit. The second thing that I think we don't talk enough about is the fact that three o'clock in the morning is not the same as three o'clock at night. Your body clock, your circadian drive, is one of the most powerful drives there is in the body. It's what makes you feel jet lagged when you take yourself on holiday to the other side of the world. And for most of us, when we get jet lagged, we have a few days of feeling out of sync, where we feel achy, nauseous, sluggish. We don't function as well as we should do until our brain resyncs ourselves and we come back into phase with the, the day where we happen to find ourselves. Jet lag is not a pleasant experience, and that is the, how it feels when you are fighting against your circadian drive, your body clock. When we ask somebody to work a night shift, we are asking them to do exactly the same thing. And while I think most of us would balk if we were to send you business class to Australia, then expect you to get off the plane at the other end and run an intensive care unit or do a busy ED shift, we don't stop and think about the fact that working at night has the same sort of physiological impact on how we are able to uh, cope with things. Um, there is lots of evidence looking at this. I like this study. Uh, this is done by a medical student uh, and a colleague of mine down in Southampton. It's a risk exercise. Um, she took uh, paediatric intensive care registrars at the beginning of a night shift and at the end of a night shift she gave them a really simple risk exercise. Um, basically it was a computer, press a button, the more you press the button the more the balloon blows up, the bigger they get the balloon without popping it, the more money they get, but the bigger the balloon gets the more likely it is to pop. They did the experiment at the beginning of the night shift and at the end of the night shift. You will not be desperately surprised to learn that at the end of the night shift, the balloons popped more often. They took riskier decisions, um, they got less money, the consequences were worse. What didn't change though was their confidence. They were just as confident making the riskier decisions at the end of a night shift as they were making the safer decisions at the beginning of a night shift. Our ability to uh, analyse how well we are functioning is impaired when we are uh, fatigued and sleep deprived. That has a huge consequence if you are finishing a night shift and deciding if you are safe to drive home. I think equally we have to acknowledge that it has a consequence if you are then called to recess half an hour before the end of your shift and the decisions that you're going to make, the judgments you're going to make. We must think about this both for our own safety and protection but also for the care that we're providing to our patients. Um, there are lots of ways that we can think about this um, uh, and this diagram is really just intended to show you that this is a very complex uh, set of things that we're thinking about. The, the fundamental point with all of this is that you are not evolved to be awake and functioning through the night. You are meant to be asleep. Every cell in your brain and body is telling you that you should be asleep. And when we try and work against that, there are consequences. And those are both immediate and also long term. We should be talking about this an awful lot more than we do. 
So what can we do about it? I said the challenge is, is we know all of this. The challenge is in translating that into practical things that take um, and allow things to change on the ground. You talked earlier about uh, that the, the proof of a change is whether something actually changes in practice. And that's the, the test that we have to ask of this. What we've been doing at Evelyn London and in Guys in St Thomas is, is trying to begin to teach people an awful lot more about normal sleep and the experience of working shift work. This is in the space of one slide, an hour's lecture uh, that I give uh, mandatory induction uh, in our hospitals. And um, this is trying to give people the basic information about sleep, sleep physiology, circadian physiology and things that you can do to cope better with working at night and to ameliorate some of those risks and consequences of fighting against your body clock. That has to be matched though by the fact that it's not just about trying to skill the people who are working better to cope better with working at night. We also must acknowledge the fact that it's not the same thing working in the middle of the night as it is in the daytime. And we must put in place mechanisms to support people to do that better. Um, so as part of uh, what we've been doing with that over the last six months in our trust, we've been really making the point that breaks are not a luxury. Um, breaks are there not really um, for our uh, benefit first and foremost, they are there to protect our patients. If you are working a 12 to 13 hour shift and you are not getting rest, you are not getting breaks, your ability to sustain function and performance over that period of time is not possible. Um, we have to stop and take breaks to be able to provide care safely, effectively and efficiently to the patients that we are charged with looking after. We are working in a system at the moment where the pressures are very high. Um, the demand on us um, is much higher than the resources we have available to deliver it. We all have a bit of that superhero uh, heroic attitude where we think that there's 10 people to see in ED, there's 100 jobs to do, that it's more important to do that from our patient's perspective than it is for us to stop and take a break. We need to remind ourselves that the opposite is true. <coughs> we function less well when we are not rested, when we don't stop and look after ourselves. And this has been very much about sending a message from the very senior levels of our trust to say we want to listen and try and make this better. We know it's not an easy click of the fingers and suddenly everybody gets a break, um, but we want to support people to think about that and emphasise that point. One of the key recommendations um, for working at night is that if you can stop and sleep during a night shift break, you're actually likely to offset some of the risks um, and consequences of fatigue um, quite significantly. Um, so when we started talking about this, we trained our trainees, they went off to different hospitals and they came back and said, well, this is great here, but we go elsewhere and we meet this attitude, this culture that's very prevalent in the NHS still that says, we're not paying you to be asleep at night time, we're paying you to work. So there is a fundamental mismatch between our understanding of circadian physiology um, and the things that we should be doing to try and offset that and what people's experience on the ground is. So we know that people feel better when they're supported, particularly around night shifts to do this, but we know that people meet all these horror stories saying it's just not possible to do it because nobody believes me that this is something we should be doing. That very much ties into the idea at the moment, which is very prevalent in the NHS, that uh, resilience is a great thing. And I think it, it, it has a lot of merit. Um, the, the things that I try and teach um, our induction is a form of resilience. It's giving people the skills to be able to cope better with working in a stressful, pressured, uh, demanding environment. But resilience cannot be all of the answer. Um, when the resources are not sufficient to meet the demands that are out there, we cannot just expect people to function better, to cope better with that pressure and stress. We can try and skill them up, but we must also acknowledge that there has to be something there to support from the other side as well. This has to be as much about what employers and organisations like the college can do to support people, um, particularly at night, but all round the clock, as well as what we can do to improve skills. We've tried to get that message out there, so all of the things that I talk about in my induction lecture, um, the message that we try to get out is summarised uh, in this article, um, which is now <coughs> open access, so free for everyone, um, which is all about managing the effects of shift work on your health. Um, none of this, the, the recommendations in it are particularly new, um, but it's about trying to get that message back out there and make people think about how they can do this better for themselves, but also how their employers can support them to do that better. We try and make as much uh, attention about this from a media perspective as we can. Um, this is a short 10 minute report uh, that was on BBC Inside Out South earlier this year with a trainee, uh, intensive care doctor, stuck in a driving simulator after finishing a night shift. It is an eye-opening way to demonstrate just how vulnerable we all are at the end of a night shift um, and just how close we come to danger on the normal uh, task of getting ourselves home after a night shift. There are specific provisions within the new contract that talk about break and rest. One of the things that the new contract does is it absolutely puts 
uh, the working hours and the ability to take breaks and rest of the staff delivering care within the NHS um, at the heart of the contract and links that explicitly to both patient safety and the safety of the doctor. Um, so it is worth knowing a bit about the contract and the things that are specifically in there about rest breaks are working patterns that are designed to help make sure the care we are delivering is safe primarily for the patients we're looking after but also to offset the uh, consequences for ourselves. So there are lots of things that I think we should be doing about this. The work that the AGBI and the uh, College of Nieces are doing at present, um, I think is, is a huge step forward. I think being able to make a lot of noise about this, encourage people to think about this more, to think about the ways that we can support people as employers uh, to work better is really important. But it must also be matched by uh, everybody else playing their part as well. So employers and trusts have a responsibility to think about things. So the, the Take a Break campaign within our trust is about trying to get people to think differently about what breaks and fatigue are all about and what the impact on patient care is. We need to think about that at uh, an NHS employer's Department of Health point of view, the contract, the role of the guardian of safe working, about trying to make sure that everything we can do to support people is in place as much as we can. Um, this is something that has been sitting at the heart uh, of everything we do for a very, very long time. Um, how it has affected has changed as we've gone over the years, but it is still there. And it must come back to acknowledging that very simple fact that three o'clock in the morning is not the same as three o'clock in the, the, the daytime. We are not evolved to be functioning in the same way at nighttime as we are in daytime. You are all experts in adapting to your patient's physiology and making very clever, very minute changes to achieve the best for care. We need to respect our own physiology and remember to look after ourselves as much as we look after our patients or else we don't deliver the care that they should be getting. That's me.